time. Our uh, reading is John 5, verses 24 to 26. Let me read it for you. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. Uh, well, this morning uh, I've entitled this, uh, this second message, What Do You Think? What Do You Think? And all of us uh, will have been asked at, at one time or another a, a question beginning with those words, won't we? What do you think? Hey, Pastor, what do you think of all the recent protests? I'm sorry? Should Christians protest? And another thing, should Christians, if we don't want to wear masks, should we wear masks? Well, you may or may not be surprised to hear that I've had a number of people ask me uh, quite recently, as a matter of fact, those very questions. And I assume it's not because they think I have all the answers, because I clearly don't. I think I've been asked because those people who are asking are, are hopeful that the answer that I provide will in some measure help them to wrestle with what they themselves are wrestling with. And they'll ask not because they will necessarily agree with the answer that I give either, but because those kinds of questions are perfectly reasonable questions to ask, aren't they? They are questions I've asked myself. Perhaps they're questions that you've asked. And so where exactly does one begin to answer questions such as these? Where does one begin to answer any questions that concern uh, how we live and what we do? Certainly, if one is a Christian, we are encouraged to always begin with the gospel. The Apostle Paul, when writing to the church in Rome, he says this. He says, do not be conformed to the standards of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so when the Christian man and the Christian woman is confronted by questions that will inevitably come their way for no other reason than they live in the world, the Apostle Paul reminds us that the standards that the world uses are not always going to be the standards that the Christian uses. The resources that the world may turn to to work out the best way forward are not necessarily the resources that the Christian will automatically turn to. At the very least, they won't be the only resources that we will turn to. The resources that the Christian should always turn to are found in the Scriptures, in the Gospel. It is the Gospel, says Paul, that, that gives shape to the way we are to think through the important existential and moral questions that come our way. The gospel informs each one of us as to which road best serves and magnifies the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If I say this, or if I think that, or if I act in, in, in such a way, what will that mean as far as the lordship and the glory and the authority of Christ is concerned? In other words, Paul says to the Christian man, and the Christian woman, that the way the world moves forward and the way that the church moves forward is altogether different. And the reason it is different is because our, our goals are different. The reason it is different is because our allegiances are different. Our reason for living and breathing and going about the things that we do are different. The way we relate to our children, the way we relate to our neighbour and our, and our government and the person checking out our groceries and the, and the telemarketer and our husband and our wife are altogether different. 
No longer does the Christian simply conform to the standards that everyone else accepts is the right way. No, no. The Christian is instead transformed, writes Paul. How? By the renewing of their mind. And therefore, when the Christian man and the Christian woman is faced with answering difficult questions, they will not automatically jump on a bandwagon that the world pushes, but will carefully consider how it is that Christ might be exalted and in what way is he glorified in the decisions that he or she makes. And so what I'd like to do is share with you some of my own thoughts as I've wrestled and as we've all wrestled, I'm sure, with these and a great many other questions. And as I've endeavoured as best I can to think Christianly, to bring each question to the foot of the cross and to allow the gospel to shape my response, I trust that my thoughts and words and actions will serve the interests of Christ and not the interests of the world, and definitely not my own interests. The truth is that we should never be afraid, church, of asking questions. Even, can I say, when we end with different answers. Every pastor worth his salt welcomes questions from members of the congregation, as well as, I might add, from those who are outside the church. Questions are important to Christians especially. Now, why is that? Oh, because we are truth seekers. What did you mean when you said... Or or how should we understand and apply today what it was that Jesus said to his disciples in the first century? Or how is it that that a God of love would sanction and even send his own son to die such a cruel death? Or why do Christians say their faith is different? Doesn't everyone say that? You see, unless we, we ask questions, we cannot learn. God wants us, church, to question that which we don't understand. God God wants us to use our minds. And so we should never be afraid of asking questions. This incredible supercomputer that God has gifted only to us, to those who have been created in his image, to, to human beings, to men and to women, to boys and to girls. It's why some of the greatest thinkers and scientists in the history of the world have been and are Christians. Despite the protestations of people such as Steven Weinberg, who, who like to paint Christians as little more than, than troublesome people who are trapped in a land that time forgot, Christians aren't afraid to question and to ponder and to think and to dream. And so Christians love to question in order to discover truth. And and they aren't at all afraid of being asked questions. And I also think there is a much more important question behind those kinds of questions that I and and perhaps some of you have been asked over the last 18 or so months. And that question is this. Should we be afraid? Should we be afraid? Amongst other things, I I think that's the question that that people are really asking. And so firstly, should should Christians be afraid of disagreeing with those in authority? Well, clearly Jesus wasn't. We saw that recently, didn't we, in the second half of John chapter 2. The authorities questioned him and he questioned them. And of course we saw the same thing in John chapter 3 as, as Jesus questioned Nicodemus, Israel's teacher. Christians should never ever be afraid of asking questions. The way that Daniel asked questions. Do I bow down to Nebuchadnezzar or do I bow down to God? Or the way the Apostle Peter asked questions. Which is right in God's eyes to listen to man? Or to listen to God? Or the way the Apostle Paul asked questions. Friends, why are you doing this? 
We too are only human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Or the way that Martin Luther asked questions. Is the church preaching the gospel? And if it isn't, can I stay silent? Is it right to stay silent? Is that what God would have me do? Or the way that Dietrich Bonhoeffer asked questions. Has my government lost its moral authority to govern? Are they honouring the God who put them there? Or the way that Martin Luther King asked questions. Is Christ glorified as black men and women are treated as inferior human beings? And so we ask the question, Lord, what should I do? And sometimes, as was the case with those I just mentioned, questioning is going to come at a great personal cost. Why? Well, because they listened first to God. They, they weren't content to be conformed to the standards of this world, but instead they sought to be transformed by the renewing of their minds. And having been transformed in their thinking, they asked questions and, and, and their lives changed. And in a great many cases, society also changed. And so knowing when to question and disagree and how to go about showing your disagreement in a way that honours God is in many respects the duty of all followers of Jesus. Jesus wasn't afraid of questioning authority and nor should his followers be, nor should we be, not of those in authority and certainly not of those who would seek to overthrow God's holy word. And so not being afraid of questioning those in authority is one thing. There will, of course, be other reasons, won't there, that, that people are afraid during these uncertain times. There'll be those who are afraid of losing their income. That's a real fear, isn't it, for a, for a great many people as businesses are forced to close and their incomes are compromised. And if we know of people who are in that position, we should do all that we can to shield them and to love them. We should walk alongside them. There will be still others who fear losing access to community support. That too is a real fear, isn't it? And as Christians, we should be mindful of those men and women in our community who are vulnerable and, and we should seek to support everyone who is finding the isolation and the loss of community difficult. And so if you know of people who find themselves in that position, please call them, particularly if they are your Christian brothers and sisters. And don't leave it to someone else. Call them and listen to them. Send them a card. R remind them that they are loved. Here's an idea. Send a Christian brother or sister a card anyway and then there is the fear of catching COVID itself but should Christians be afraid of catching COVID and when I'm asked that question my my answer is always the same by all means church wear a mask by all means follow government guidelines that are intended to keep its citizens safe all citizens safe but under no circumstances should we be afraid. If you are a Christian, wear a mask by all means, but, but don't retreat into a bubble and hide. And don't simply wear a mask because someone tells you that you should wear a mask. Obedience should never be blind. When instructed to wear a mask and there is no medical condition preventing us from doing so, we should do so because it makes good sense and because it goes some way to protecting those around us. Wearing a mask hurts no one and may in fact serve to protect others. We don't even have to enjoy it. I don't. But we should always be ready and willing to listen to those that God has placed in authority. The word of God makes it clear that as a first principle, that is to be our default position. 
Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, writes Peter, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. So also Paul writes this, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities which exist have been established by God. Now, of course, that raises a whole lot of other questions that we don't have time to get into this morning. But, but as a first principle, that is where God's people are to start. And so we follow our government's advice in order to protect both ourselves and those around us. But whatever you do, if you are a Christian, don't be afraid and don't retreat. Of course, the devil hopes that that is exactly what Christians will do, that God's people will, will hide themselves away like the rest of the world whenever uncertainty or trouble comes their way. One thing that has been absolutely clear over the course of this pandemic is that so many people are fearful of losing their life. They fear losing their loved ones. Now, to be fair, some people... And in fact, the, the overwhelming majority of people, I'd say, do have a reason to be afraid. They should be afraid because they don't know the one who has conquered death. They should be afraid because if COVID takes a hold of them and, and runs its course and destroys their body, it really will be all over. Not because their body is destroyed, but because their eternity will have been lost. Jesus says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Fear God is what Jesus is saying. And just as Jesus said it to those who, who cared to listen in the first century, to, to people who faced death every day, Jesus says the same thing to those of us who are living in the 21st century. When a man or a woman fears God, when, when they are careful to listen to him and, and follow his direction, well, there really is nothing left to fear. And so although people may fear catching COVID the same way a soldier fears going into battle, they, they're afraid that, that they'll be the next, well, that simply isn't true of Christians. A Christian shouldn't be at all afraid of dying. Fear of death is the very antithesis of everything we know to be true and hold dear and which is stamped on every page of God's word. Rather than fear death, Rather than cower or run or do all we can to hold on to this life, those of us who have placed our faith and hope and trust in the God of Israel, the God of the entire universe, in fact, we face death confidently and without fear, knowing that death has itself been dealt a mortal blow. We don't like it or welcome it or run to it, but we certainly don't fear it. Of course, because Christians aren't afraid, that does not mean, therefore, that God's people should go looking for trouble. Engaging, in my view, in the kind of folly that so many in Sydney and, and Melbourne in recent times have done, protesting and increasing the potential for further and prolonged lockdown is, in my view, both unhelpful and reckless. Christians definitely should not look for trouble. Christians should not poke the bear or step foot in the den of the lion, or run headlong into the burning building, hoping that, that when we do, God will be there to prevent the bear or the lion or the flames from causing us harm. That is what I think. Christians should neither look for trouble, nor do we stir it up. Like Jesus, the one we follow, we refuse to put the Lord our God to the test. We are not called to put ourselves in harm's way just to see if God will rescue us. We are to give unto God that which is God's and we are to give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. We may question Caesar. We may even disagree at times and we will disagree at times. But when we do, wherever possible, we should do so with respect and, and we don't seek to provoke Caesar unnecessarily. 
On the contrary, we, we serve Caesar. We are called by God to live as wise servants, careful to tread only where the master first leads. And it sh certainly shouldn't be lost on anyone that Jesus never once led violent protests. And when you look at where he lived and when he lived, he certainly had a great deal to protest about. And it's not that Jesus didn't protest. He just did it in a way that no one expected. And so how did Jesus protest? Well, he protested by honouring God loving his neighbour and laying down his life. Honouring God, loving his neighbour and laying down his life. That, church, is how Jesus protested. And so when we do what is right and live for God, which at times will mean speaking against those in authority, trouble will find us. Look at Daniel. Look at Jesus. Look at Peter and Paul. Look at Martin Luther. Look at Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Martin Luther King. Look at Christians living in Iran and China and North Korea. You see, when we follow Jesus, trouble will find us. It may even seek to nail us to a cross. And so Christians can be disobedient. Jesus was disobedient. And what was his greatest act of civil disobedience? Well, he rose again, didn't he? The Jewish authorities sentenced him to death. Pilate sentenced him to death. In church, they expected him to stay dead. They dec issued a decree, a decree that was made into law. But Jesus didn't listen, did he? In other words, he was disobedient. And so if that is what we do, then, then no matter what comes our way, if, if he is leading, if God is leading and we are following, the bear will fall, the lion will fall, the fire will not singe us or burn a single head, hair on our head. And where that is not the case, where the bear and the lion and the fire do consume us, as it looked as though it had consumed Jesus, because we follow where he leads, we remain confident that just as he rose from the dead, so too will we. And so my greatest fear, church, during this season of COVID uncertainty isn't that I might catch this terrible virus or that those I love who are themselves Christians might catch this terrible virus. No, no. My greatest fear is that God's own people who follow the one who rose from the dead and who, having conquered the grave, is now seated upon an eternal throne, ruling over an eternal kingdom, that the subjects of that kingdom, rather than live confidently and shine with the power and the hope and the light of the gospel, instead they choose to hide because they're afraid. What is it that we should be afraid of? What is death? Isn't death merely the servant of him who holds all things in his hands? Once it did have power over us. Now it does not. Yes, it's true. You and I, we were held in death's bondage, weren't we? Yes, it's true. You and I were once terrified that, that sooner or later death would come knocking on our door and, and take a hold of us by the hand and lead us to where we don't want to go, to a place where we weren't yet ready for. But church, that is simply no longer true. What is death? Death is merely a door into the presence of the one who loves us and who, and who cares for us and who calls us to follow him. And so when we wear a mask or isolate, we do so not because we fear. When we wear a mask or isolate, we do so only in so far as we don't want to offend those who are afraid. We, we wear a mask also to protect the weak to protect and to care for the elderly and the infirm. We wear a mask, church, because we love our neighbour. But we do so knowing that with or without a mask, every man, every woman and every child must one day give an account to the one who holds them in the palm of his hand. 
And so COVID should no more determine how we live our lives if we are Christians than anyone or anything else should direct our path. God's people should never, not ever, be afraid of losing that which God tells us to freely lay down. The moment we pick up our cross, we have there and then forfeited our lives. We lay it down. We are, if we are Christians, already dead. What is there then to fear if the only thing we can lose we've already lost? And so unless God leads you, don't poke the bear, don't step into the den of the lion, don't run into the flames, unless God leads you. In other words, don't go putting yourself unnecessarily in harm's way. That's just silly. And in no way does that honour God. And so whatever else we do, church, let us not be afraid. Let us, with every ounce of strength we have left in our bodies, proclaim the victory of Christ. May people hear it in the words we, we speak. May people see it in the lives we, we live. And may people even see it in the way we die. After all, we are, church, already dead. Isn't that what we declared when we were baptised? We have been buried with Christ. Don't fear that which can no longer touch us. Don't fear that which no longer has authority over us. And so how do I answer those who ask me, Pastor, should Christians wear masks? Should Christians isolate? like everybody else, should Christians protest? And I say, wear a mask. I say, isolate if and when you have to. Quarantine as directed by the government. Be responsible in all you do. Ask questions. Obey the law of the land as long as and whilst ever it doesn't contravene God's law. Honour Caesar by doing what is right. And as you do, you honour God. But never be afraid of asking questions. And always live as children of light in a dark world. And whatever happens, never ever be afraid of death. Don't let anyone tell you to fear that which Christ has already defeated. Church, we are a victorious people. We are God's people, and may we, the church of the living God, never ever forget that, for Christ's sake and for his glory. Amen. Have a uh, great uh, day, and uh, enjoy the coming week that God has given to us. If you're in lockdown, uh, read God's word and sing his praises. Encourage one another, and don't forget... Take the time, perhaps, to write a card to a Christian brother or sister this week. God bless.